Today, it's the Muscle Car Body Work Special. From filler and stink rock to dollies and hammers, learn the secrets from a pro. Plus, Brent gives a tight new look to Red Sled's bumpers and a 66 Mustang with the Hypo Glow. Hey, welcome to Muscle Car. Red Sled here has gotten quite a bit of sheet metal work done. We've even gotten a jump start on the body work, and it's time to finish smoothing out the rest of it. Now, the Tribute Trans Am, what's that about the same stage in progress? And even though it looks pretty menacing in this flat black, we can't paint over it, and that means that it's got to get stripped and smoothed out as well. So get ready for a Muscle Car body work extravaganza. When the 61 Impala rolled in, it looked like it came right out of a swamp. After frame makeover and acres of sheet metal, it's well on its way to becoming red sled. The 69 Firebird didn't look quite as bad at first. Then we got it back from the blaster. Because of the horrors hidden under the paint, about 90% of the steel had to be replaced. With its custom honeycomb wheels and roll bar in place, it's starting to look more like year one's vision for the Tribute Trans Am. Now, two whole cars worth of body work to do, you gotta start somewhere, and I figure the Impala hood's as good a place as any. Now, it's in pretty good shape, but it does still have a couple issues. We've got dents and a couple splits here that we need to be taken care of, but before we can do that, we gotta strip it down to metal. 3M's clean and strip disc makes short work of the primer, because I need to see bare metal before I bring in the stud gun. Studs come in several sizes, designed for working on different thicknesses of sheet metal. These are medium studs, and after attaching them, I'll start working from the outside of the dent to the center. If I could reach the back side of the hood, I'd use a dolly, but since I can't, the studs will allow me to put pressure on the sheet metal where I need it. The life of the stud is glorious, but short. Once they've served their purpose, I'll cut them off and grind them down. The corner of the hood has some metal fatigue, probably caused by rusted spot welds. This may look like a minor area, but it needs to be fixed now or it'll just keep growing later. There's one more dent that needs to be straightened out before I can start blocking. That means one more stud meets its fate. Now, dents are pretty easy to find by hand, but waves are a whole nother story. That's where guide coat comes in. Usually if you guide coat the whole panel, then hit it with a long board, it'll kind of show you where you're at. Guide coat is available in powdered or sprayable forms. I prefer the spray because when it's applied, it's stuck. Powdered guide coat doesn't adhere to the surface and can come off when you don't want it to, but it's really just a matter of personal preference. Nice straight hood doesn't look too straight anymore, does it? Now, if you notice here, I'm using a flexible block. So as I sand over the front of that hood, I'm actually grabbing this block and bending it down to conform so I don't make this thing look like a golf ball. All right, now I'm gonna teach you guys a lesson here that me and a lot of other guys have had to learn the hard way. Anytime you're body working a hood, make sure it's sitting on the rack with the framework directly on it, not the back of the hood skin. If the hood skin comes in contact with the rack and you body work over it, it can actually create a high spot. Then when you pick it up, it'll make a low spot. That'll ruin your whole day. Time to mix up some plastic. Since I'm covering a large area with a very thin coat, I'll thin it out with some metal glaze. This will allow the plastic to spread more consistently and will also help it self-level. Try to keep the filler as smooth and even as you can and keep the pressure consistent on your spreader. The closer you get it now, the less sanding you'll have to do later. Okay, now if you notice here, I'm not sanding straight up and down along this body line. I could technically do that and blend in this area right here, but if I did, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna cut a low spot all the way through here. Now there's two ways you could deal with that. You could either prime over that fill it in, but then later on as it dries, you'll actually see that shadowing back through your paint. The best way to do it is as you're sanding, kick the back end of your block out. That way you're taking that edge and blending it off into the face of the, of the hood. 
Well, now that I got most of this sanded out and you can see through a lot of it, you might be asking yourself, okay, why didn't he just prime it and then block it out? Well, I tell you, the waves may be barely there, but if you were to fill them in with primer, you're basically going to end up with primer like this in the waves, primer like that on your high spots. Well, when the primer shrinks down, you're going to end up with a wave in the face of your hood. The filler is a whole lot more stable. Okay, I'm going to leave the Impala in Brent's hands and get back on the Firebird. Now, after we got all the new sheet metal put on it, we could have sent it back to the blaster and had it all stripped off, but honestly, it'd probably just be more trouble than it's worth, so I'm going to hand strip it. Once it's stripped down, it's a good idea to hit it with some reducer to clean the surface before you start the body work. You can use a degreaser, just make sure the product won't leave a residue. And now this is a perfect example of where stink rock will work perfect. I've got this weird curve coming down here, I've got a curve coming in this direction, I've got a weird high spot or something going on right here. This is perfect for stink rock. Some of you probably remember stink rock from the Nova facelift. For those who missed it, the real name for it is grill brick. It's great for body working compound curves because it forms to whatever surface you're sanding. Why do I call it stink rock? <laughs> Just buy some and try it. You'll find out quick enough. The stink rock's put on hold for a few minutes so I can work the flat areas with the longboard. Now let me show you what I'm looking at here. A lot of the time on these aftermarket parts, it's real common that the stampings aren't exactly perfect. You can see here where I've got the filler, I've been trying to blend this in, but it's actually a low spot in there and I'm running into a high spot over here. So what I need to do is completely blend this in and eliminate that dip. Well guys, it's time for a break and I got a lot more quality time to spend with the old stink rock here. So you keep working on the groove in your sofa, I'll keep working on the groove in this fender. After the break, a bumper mod that gives the Impala some smooth style. Hey, we're back. I'm making some pretty good progress here in the Trans Am. I still got a long ways to go. Now, if you remember earlier in the season, we told you we had some cool plans for the bumpers and the Impala. So I'm going to hang out over here and keep making dust. Brent's going to show you how to take a five piece bumper and make it into a one piece. Impalas and many other cars of this era came with multi piece bumpers. It simplified the stamping process and made it easier to replace one section if you ran into your neighbor's Edsel but we're after a more streamlined look, and smoothing them out is the way to go. Modifying bumpers isn't a new concept. It's an old custom trick that's becoming popular again. So Brent's grabbed his rod and TIG welder and started by filling in the gaps between the three main pieces. The clearance on these bumpers is pretty wide, and we think it'd look a whole lot better if it was tucked in a little tighter. So 3 8 of an inch on each side is heading to the scrap heap. Once the excess is trimmed out and the edges are dressed up, a few more passes with the TIG brings it back together. Brent's pulling the bumper off to make it easier to get to the areas that need to be finished up. Even the bumper rats are being molded in. If you're going to go through this much trouble, hey, you might as well go all the way. Brent's dressing up the welds, but if you do this, talk to your chromer first. Some shops prefer to dress the welds themselves to avoid having to fill in dips created by over grinding. And lastly, make sure to test fit it before you send it off. If you end up having to modify it later, the chrome shop may love you, but your wallet won't. 
The difference here is subtle, but it really adds to the overall look of the car. Yeah, I just about got the mud work done on the Trans Am, and just in time too, because with those bumpers done, it's time to finish up the body work on Red Sled. Now hang tight, because after we show you some classic muscle, I'll give you the lowdown on some metal working tools and techniques. Coming up, saddle up in a 66 Mustang that breaks loose from the herd. Today on Flashback, a 1966 Mustang GT 289 Hypo. The Mustang hit the market in 1964 and quickly became an American legend. By 1966, close to a million had been sold. One of the most coveted cars of that year is the 289 Hypo. And this numbers matching beauty, but it ain't just a show pony. It's rearing its head and ready to break out of the stable. Mustangs came with three different breeds of engines to choose from in 66, all of them 289 V8 small blocks. There was the G code, which only made about 200 horse, and then you had the A code, which made another 25. But if you really wanted to break away from the pack, you could get the K code, High Performance 289. It was nicknamed the Hypo and was the most powerful engine available in a factory Mustang. This little pony could gallop up to 271 horsepower at 6,000 RPM and boasted 10 and a half to one compression. The Hypo debuted in the 63 Fairlane and it was first dropped in a Mustang in 65. Many people feel it was Ford's greatest small block engine. The secret to its power was a larger four barrel Autolite carburetor, free flowing exhaust manifolds and solid lifters. The camshaft was specially ground for high lift given the Hypo its unique sound. Everything got beefed up in this engine to handle the extra power, from the rod bearings and bolts to the harmonic balancer, as well as the larger four-blade fan and alternator pulley. It also had a dual-point distributor with a mechanical advance. Saddling up in this Mustang is like a day at the races. A set of rally pack gauges on the steering column and a close ratio four-speed told you this horse was ready to run wild. 66 was the first year seat belts were mandatory and you were gonna need them. To smooth out the bumps on the trail, all Hypo Mustangs came with heavy-duty shocks and springs front and rear, and a larger front sway bar. The rear axle came in three sets of gear ratios, 350s, 389s, or the one that's in this stallion, 411. The 66 Mustang was virtually identical to the 65. Why mess with success? This coupe also sports the GT package, which features front fog lamps, side stripes, dual trumpet exhaust, and badges on the front fenders and gas cap. The engine also got spruced up with a chromed air cleaner and valve covers, and you got front disc brakes. But when you gotta say, whoa, horsey. Out of over 600,000 Mustangs built in 1966, only 5,469 Hypos were sold. That's less than 1%. Maybe this was due to the option's hefty $433 price tag. You also couldn't get air conditioning, power steering, or power brakes. And because Ford knew buyers were probably going to be racing these high-performance cars, they only came with a 90-day, 4,000-mile warranty. 67 was the last year for the Hypo Mustang. Ford wedged a 390 big block in the Mustang that year, and from then on, the engines only got bigger and badder. But this old horse ain't going to be put out to pasture anytime soon. <laughs> you can bet on it. Up next, Rick takes the mystery out of hammer and dolly work. Hey guys, welcome back. You know, we've all seen guys on TV, including myself, smacking sheet metal around with a hammer. A few good whacks and suddenly through the magic of television, it's perfect. Well, I figured it was about time I shed some light on some of the different tools that are out there and show you some basic metalworking techniques.
You notice these all have two faces. Now they come in a lot of different combinations, but if you're just starting out, you're going to want to make sure you get some basic features. Now this one has a waffle face on it. It's designed for shrinking metal. It actually pulls it together when you strike it. The other end here, you're going to need that for working on body lines. Now another feature that you want to look for is a pick. These come in a lot of different shapes and sizes and they're basically designed for moving small areas of metal. On the face of this one, if you notice, it's actually flat. This is a finishing hammer and it's not to be confused with a round faced shaping hammer. Now if you got a little bigger budget, you can start investing in some more specialty type hammers. This hammer is designed for rolling on door skins. This one, well it's got a finishing face on either side of it and it's basically just got a longer reach. This hammer is a square faced finishing hammer and it's for getting into those hard to reach areas. Now the other part of the equation is dollies and spoons. They're used for backing up sheet metal while you're hammering. They come in all kinds of different shapes and sizes to fit just about anything you're going to be working on. Now before I can show you how to fix a dent, I need a dent to fix. But I can take care of that. Now when sheet metal gets dented, it stretches, and the key to fixing a dent is putting the metal back where it's supposed to be. Seems pretty simple, right? If you can reach the back side of the panel, it'll make your life a whole lot easier. Then you can use a dolly and a shrinking hammer to shrink the metal back into shape. This is called on dolly hammering. A dolly is used for support as the hammer pushes the metal back into position. On dolly, well it means exactly that, striking directly against the dolly with the metal sandwiched in between. Another technique you can use if you can reach the back of the metal is off dolly hammering. Off dolly means that the hammer is used around the circumference of the dent instead of in the center. As you apply pressure to the center, the metal surrounding the dent is pushed up. Tap in the high area, well, it'll relieve the stress and allow the low area to come back. This technique is used more for larger dents. I'm going to finish it out with a stud gun. What a lot of people don't know is you can use these things for heat shrinking also. Just make sure to have a cup of cold water and a rag handy. Now we've barely scratched the surface on metalworking today and we could do an entire series on the finer points. If you want to keep learning more, then keep watching Muscle Car because there's always plenty of metalwork to be done around here. But for this week, we're out of time. So until next time, we're out of here.